Welcome to your pilot debrief. I'm Hoover. In today's video, we're going to take a look at two routine flights that ended in a takeoff tragedy. And this is going to be an interesting show because originally when I uh, planned to do this live stream, there was, you know, one tragedy that I wanted to talk about in particular. And unfortunately, some sad news hit yesterday that we're going to get to. Uh, so we're actually going to take a look at two different tragedies today. Now, I'm going to bring this up on the screen here and uh, hopefully, uh, what I'm looking forward to is engagement from everyone out there in the aviation community uh, as we talk about these different events and tragedies. So this is the one that I had planned on talking about. And if you hadn't seen the news on this, this is from the uh, the plane crash that killed Representative uh, Peltola's husband, uh, where it had about 500 pounds of uh, moose meat and antlers on board the aircraft. And then the other tragedy that we're going to talk about today as well is uh, Air Safety Institute Richard McSpadden's uh, death uh, on takeoff uh, that happened just yesterday. So very unfortunate tragedy and uh, some sad news uh, on that. So before we dive into both of those uh, tragedies, though, and kind of take a look at what happened uh, and go over some of those details, um, I, I wanted to share with you guys my experience with this channel. And just first of all, thank you for, be for being a part of the, uh, the Pilot Debrief community and your contributions to the videos, the emails that I get from everybody out there, uh, and the comments uh, that I see where you're able to share your expertise, not only with me, you know, as I cover these events and provide, you know, some sort of aviation mishap analysis, but also you're sharing that expertise with everyone else in the aviation community that sees these videos. So people are able to learn from your comments. And as I was going through a lot of those comments, that's why I realized, you know, for, for a live stream, it offers this unique opportunity for you as the audience to engage and for others to benefit from that and for us to have, you know, kind of like this dialogue going back and forth. And also going forward, uh, my plan with these live streams is to start incorporating other uh, pilots into the live stream where I can have them as a guest host. I've got a couple other uh, folks lined up already, including uh, some other individuals that have aviation channels on YouTube. So I think you're going to really enjoy that. And really, I think it's going to give us a lot to talk about. Um, so we'll start by talking with uh, with this first crash here for uh, Richard McSpadden. So if you're not familiar uh, with him, he's the senior vice president of the uh, Aircraft Owner uh, and Pilots Association uh, Air Safety Institute and tragically passed away yesterday in the crash of a Cessna uh, 177RG near Lake Placid Airport in upstate New York. Yep. Sorry. Let me bring this up here for you guys to see. There we go. Um, so right now, what we're seeing is the early reports indicate that the uh, the Cardinal had an emergency on takeoff shortly before 5 p.m. They tried to make it back to the runway, uh, but didn't get there. And uh, the nature of the emergency wasn't immediately known. So not a lot of uh, details on this incident so far. But, you know, if you don't know, uh, Richard, he's got quite a history, you know, former commander of the uh, Air Force Thunderbirds demonstration team. Uh, joined the Air Safety Institute in 2017. And, you know, you can go over to his, um, the Air Safety Institute YouTube channel. He's featured in a lot of videos there and, and does an excellent job of providing, you know, kind of an early look at some of the the, the more notable aviation mishaps that have happened uh, in recent years since he's been in this role uh, with the Air Safety Institute and uh, providing a, a really good contribution to the aviation community. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's just a, a very somber reminder, I think, of the inherent risk associated with flying aircraft. Uh, so it, it really doesn't matter, you know, how many hours you have or, or how much experience you have, um, you know, flying, you know, things can happen, things go wrong. And and whether you, you, you try to, to mitigate that risk with planning and briefing and preparation, you know, we, we do the best we can. And inevitably, sometimes things, you know, just just don't work out. Uh, so, uh, we're, we're going to not speculate on what happened in this incident. We're not, I'm not going to take a guess as to, you know, anything that went wrong. Um, but we will take a look at it further on as the NTSB conducts their preliminary report and starts providing some more details. Uh, the two, there was another victim on the flight. It was Russ Francis. So he's a former, uh, tight end, uh, played back, you know, in, in the seventies and eighties with the, uh, the Patriots, uh, and the, uh, the 49ers. Uh, and according to the report, you know, what we see here in the news is that, um, 
Russ Francis had purchased the Lake Placid Airways tour business at the airport. And so the two of them were flying. And it's a, from what we know, I think it says that Richard was in the right seat uh, when the crash happened. And that's pretty much the, the extent of the detail. So um, again, just a, a really unfortunate tragedy there. Um, if you guys get a chance, you know, as you're tuning in, if you have questions, drop them in the comments below. I'm open to, to talk about anything, honestly, you know, because this is really a first chance to interact with you guys as an aviation community, as a pilot debrief community. And just to give you a little bit of background on myself, for those of you that don't know me, I, I go by Hoover. I, I don't, uh, I try not to share my real name on the channel because of uh, my employment affiliation, because I currently do fly for a major airline. And I spent 20 years in the Air Force. I started off flying the uh, F-15E Strike Eagle, did that for uh, a few years. And then I was selected to participate in a uh, Marine Corps exchange program where I flew the F-18 Hornet for three years. I did one year out, out at Miramar uh, with the RAG uh, where I actually got carry, carrier qualified. So that was uh, <laughs> quite the experience as an Air Force guy. And then I spent two years uh, after that in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina with the Hawks uh, flying a, an F-18D. And then I went back to the Strike Eagle. Again, did that for a couple more years up in uh, Idaho and then did my uh, uh, penalty lap, if you will, <laughs> on the uh, staff tour and doing some non-flying jobs uh, in the Air Force. And then eventually went back to the Strike Eagle where I retired out of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. So uh, at the time of that retirement, you, you know, this is right before COVID happened. And so was planning to transition to the airlines and unfortunately, COVID happened. Things kind of got derailed. So I went and I did some flying for a Part 135 organization for a couple of years, flying a Citation XL. So I've got about nine months experience doing that. And then now I'm on board with a major airline where I fly an, an Airbus uh, A350. So that, that's my background. Uh, in terms of like aviation safety, the reason why I started this channel was when I was in the Air Force, uh, one of my last jobs was the chief of safety at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. So overseeing, you know, aviation uh, safety, weapon safety, and occupational uh, safety as well. And it, it gave me a really unique insight into looking into aviation mishaps and everything, you know, that, that goes on that sometimes uh, pilots don't, don't see. And so I thought of starting this channel because when I looked out there, I, there are some other channels that do provide some aviation mishap analysis, and there are there's some really good channels that do that. Uh, but I wanted to share my own unique perspective, especially because as I looked at some of the NTSB reports on these incidents, you know, what I was gathering was, you know, you'd see in this NTSB report that, you know, the probable cause was the pilot exceeded the critical angle of attack. And you don't really get much out of that in terms of an actual debrief, because as a former fighter pilot, that was where we did all of our learning was in the pilot debrief. You know, you do your maintenance debrief to talk to maintenance about the things that uh, are wrong with the jet or things that, that you notice. And then you go back and you do your pilot debrief and you kind of put your ego aside. And that's when the real learning begins. And so you sit down and you walk through and, and you know, we watch the tapes, you know, from uh, as much as we need to, to draw out as many lessons as we can. And so for these NTSB final reports, when you look through them, you know, sometimes they're only a few pages long. And it's only when you get into the docket on the NTSB website where you have all the supplemental information, the supplemental documents that, you know, can sometimes be 40, 50, 100 pages long of, of information that really paint a much clearer picture of everything that led up to the pilot exceeding the critical angle of attack and why that happened. And so that's why I created this channel. That's why I created the pilot debrief. And, and again, just very thankful for you guys for sharing uh, the experience there. So um, let's take a look and see, we've got a lot of people chiming in here and I don't have somebody on the back end running all of this show for me. So what you see is what you get guys. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the, uh, the tough part of running a channel like this is, you know, I've got three kids, I've got three dogs. We're in the middle of, you know, living between houses here. We're in an Airbnb and, and I try to make this happen for you guys. So, uh, thank you guys for, for keeping the comments, uh, civil, uh, you know, so far, I really appreciate that and looking forward to, uh, to some more of your questions. Um, the other incident that we do have more details on that we can take a look at is the uh, accident that happened up in Alaska. So this is the image that you may have seen out on the news uh, being shared around. Uh, this actually came from uh, one of the hunters that was 
you know, up there in Alaska when this incident took place where he took a video of the takeoff. That video has not been made available to the public. As far as I know, I wasn't able to locate it anywhere. Sometimes the, um, uh, the NTSB usually includes that, those videos and the, that type of footage when they produce their final report, when they have the docket of all the information available. So uh, when that becomes available, we'll, we'll take a look and see if it's something that we can actually uh, benefit from sharing and learning from that. From the Aviation Safety Network, uh, this is actually, let's, yeah, let's go back to this one. I'm sorry. We'll go back to this one first with Richard McSpadden. Um, this is the uh, the Cessna 177, uh, 177 uh, Romeo Golf Cardinal. So Lake Placid, November 5, uh, 4 5, Papa Zulu was the registration. Two occupants on board, two fatalities. Destroyed when it impacted trees and terrain at the end of the runway at Lake Placid Airport. Two occupants on board sustained fatal injuries. This is a Cessna 177 Cardinal, if you're not familiar. So single engine, high wing aircraft uh, made by Cessna. First designed to uh, replace the Cessna 172. And then, you know, as the models kind of continued on, they went through all these different models. The Romeo Golf is the one with the retractable gear. Uh, began producing in 1970. And then it's got a, a little bit bigger engine, 200 horsepower there, uh, with a, a little bit of the increase of the maximum weight as well. A little bit faster cruise speed, too. And unfortunately, that, like I said, this is as, about as much detail I have uh, on that incident and that mishap. You know, the you know question out there is you know impossible turn. Um, so, for in my opinion, again, I haven't. There's no video that I've seen, and I haven't heard anybody else talk about this. And I don't want to speculate. And, and definitely, we want to offer our condolences to the family and friends. Um, and not, you know, rush to any, any sort of judgment about what happened. But that, that's the number one thing that people think of when you have an, an aviation tragedy on takeoff where, where you hear about an aircraft that is turning around and trying to make it back to the airport and, and they crash. For an individual like, like Richard, who has, you know, thousands of hours, uh, you know, and t- a ton of experience, you know, flying several different aircraft, you know, I... I would not assume that that's what happened. It, it, it is definitely possible, but it's not something that I would immediately, you know, think is, is, is the cause for, for what happened in this incident. So, uh, but it is something that I know the NTSB will take a look at and, you know, all that stuff. So um, he currently right now, he leads a team of certified flight instructors and, and content creators. So he, basically kind of runs that YouTube website. So for a guy that's talked about the impossible turn and talked about um, aviation mishaps, again, it's just really tragic to see something like this, you know, happen. So he's got over 5,000 hours and a variety of civilian and military aircraft. Uh, He's owned a couple aircraft over the years. And and again, with all of his his experience with the Thunderbirds, you know, with a hundred flight demonstrations, uh, flying the lead aircraft, um, you know, obviously a very capable pilot that, that knows, you know, uh, about aerodynamics and how to handle an aircraft. Uh, but again, just a sad reminder that, that something like this, uh, can happen. So, um, let's see. Yep. I agree, uh, with you, Hugh. Uh, I, I really hope it wasn't an impossible turn, uh, because he has done videos talking about that. And then, do you think having an AOA indexer on a light plane, especially a bush, bush plane, can help safety-wise? Um, I, I think so. I mean, anything that gives you um, additional, uh, something else to, to give you some additional guidance or, or something else to reference to help you understand, you know, the performance capability of the aircraft, especially if you don't have a lot of hours uh, in that aircraft and, and you're still learning to fly. Uh, but I know some pilots that, that love using those, and I know some pilots that, you know, will never reference it. It, it, it just depends on, on the pilot, you know, and the experience. Um, but I, I think in general, it's, it's ultimately important to, you know, as a pilot, take the time, especially if you're not flying on a consistent and regular basis, 
for, you know, every time you, you're going to go fly to think about and, and talk through all the different contingencies, you know, as, as, a, as a fighter pilot, one of the things that we do in our briefing uh, is we talk about, you know, all the possible contingencies, you, you know, we go over them pretty quickly because when you're flying out of the same airfield on a regular basis, you have a set number of, you know, if I lose an engine on takeoff, if this happens, if my gear doesn't retract, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I think for someone that isn't flying as much or as frequently, it's even more important to talk about those things, or especially when you're flying at a field that you're not familiar with, or when you're flying in a um, situation where, you know, you haven't experienced, you know, the, the type of weather that's around the field at that time, or maybe uh, the traffic pattern is a lot busier. Just anytime you find yourself in a, you, or that you know you're going to be in a situation that, that, you know, you can predict and you haven't experienced before, it's always good to kind of walk through those things and give yourself as much prep as possible uh, for that. So th this is a question I get asked a lot of, of whether I fly general aviation. Uh, I currently do not right at this moment. Um, that is something that I, unfortunately, like it's, I, I wish I could, um, I'm, I, there's a field right down the road from me here. Uh, I live just outside of Charlotte and, uh, I've made my way down there. Um, but currently right now <laughs> I've got, I've got a lot on my plate to be honest with you guys, uh, between my three kids, I've got one in elementary school, one in middle school, one in high school, uh, between moving houses and between a full-time job as an airline pilot and, really, this is almost like a second full-time job making these videos for you guys. It becomes very difficult, but that is something that I'm trying to find a way to do to get more involved in general aviation, because uh, I, I feel like I'd like to give back more to the aviation community. Uh, so that's something that, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to doing in the future. So, um, all right. So back to uh, the, the Piper PA-18 Super Cub incident up in Alaska. November 109 Tango, uh, manufactured in 1952. Now, something that you guys might not know on, on the Aviation Safety Network here, when it says the, uh, the the location and the departure airport, this isn't always accurate, especially in this location, um, or especially in this incident. So what we're going to take a look at here is this actually, the operation uh, is taking place out of Holy Cross Airport which is way up in, in Northern Alaska here. So kind of a very remote area. The um, aircraft home base of operations is here at Holy Cross. St. Mary's that they talk about in the report is, is a field over here. Where this mishap takes place is somewhere up here uh, in these you know foothills. Uh, so a very rural remote area where you know this guy's taking some people out to do some hunting, you know, just, just standard what should have been a routine trip uh, back and forth between there and, you know, and, and Holy Cross, um, if you will. Now, what was going on here was two days before the accident, the pilot took a group of five hunters, a guide and their equipment from Holy Cross. They set up camp next to the landing strip. You've got some hilly terrain there and they were going to hunt moose and get it all prepped to take back to the operations base. During the day before, they hunted a moose, they coordinated with the pilot, and he was able to meet them and ferry the meat the next day. So on the day of the accident, the pilot arrived about 1540. They loaded the airplane with the first batch of meat and took off. Everything's normal, normal. And so it comes back. Um, and then uh, the after, let's see. Yep. And then on the second trip, he returned to the camp about 1940 for the second and final load of meat. Now, during that next hour, it, they spent quite a bit of time loading up. They reported the airplane held about 50 to 70 pounds more meat than during the previous flight. They had some strapped into the rear passenger seat area with both the seatbelt and cord, and they had some loaded into the airplane's belly pod, which did not have tie-down provisions. And then they also tied the antlers to the right wing strut. The antlers were cupped outward and perpendicular to the direction of flight. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit later on because... Uh, there's some information I found there. I think that's is going to be very helpful uh, to to what we know about uh, happened. Pilot told the hunter that he did perform fuel calculations and would be at reserve fuel levels on arrive at, arrival at Holy Cross. They discussed the weather, observed the wind was generally calm and from the north, but also intermittently variable and gusting. Uh, 
Uh, members of the group reported to the pilot that the wind was gusting much stronger at the departure end of the airstrip. He boarded the airplane, but positioned it for departure. The ground roll was slightly longer than before. The airplane appeared to be more labored than during the previous flight. And then as it reached the end of the airstrip, it pitched up and turned sharply to the right. But rather than climbing as before, the airplane flew behind the adjacent ridgeline and out of view. Uh, they the, the hunters kind of thought that it was okay, but then when the airplane didn't appear from behind the ridge, they ran to the top of the ridge, looked down, and saw that he had crashed. Uh, as they approached, he was still unconscious. They activated the SOS feature on the uh, SAT messenger device, and basically he became less responsive during the next uh, couple hours, at, at which time he eventually passed away, unfortunately. And so... That video that I mentioned of, that one of the hunters took of the takeoff accident, that's where that still photo came from. And so, you know, we haven't seen that yet. It does, they do say that the, the NTSB said that the video showed the airplane began the ground roll at the southern end of the airstrip, departed to the north and uphill. The flaps were retracted and the tail of the airplane came up as soon as the pilot applied engine power. The ground roll was only about 530 feet and immediately after takeoff, the airplane pitched up and rolled 20 degrees to the right, and then appeared to roll to a wings level attitude. And the video ended a few seconds later. So that is what is on the aviation safety network. Uh, when we look at the NTSB uh, investigation report for this, this is kind of where the aviation safety network pulled a lot of this data from, but there's a couple of unique things in this report that I wanted to, uh, to point out. Um, First of all, you, you can see in the video, obviously, um, the, the moose antlers on the right-hand side. You can see that that belly pod uh, there underneath the aircraft where he, he stored some of the additional meat. And then this is a, a kind of an image that the NTSB put together of the accident site. So it's it's kind of hard to get a sense for, for this ridge line and the change in elevation here of, of how much that is. But you've got, you know... Uh, a takeoff location here. This is, you know, what he was using as an airstrip with North being to the right. He gets airborne closer to the end of what they're calling the airstrip here, and then is able to make it initially over this ridge line uh, be before he crashed. Now, what they've said so far, if we kind of take a look at some of this stuff, is that, um, let's see here. There's another image uh, of the uh, of the accident on site. So the engine contained oil. Yeah, here's here's where they talk about this. The engine contained oil. There was no evidence uh, indicating a catastrophic engine failure. And although the wing uh, tank fuel lines had been breached, residual quantities of fuel were observed in both tanks. So that obviously basically saying they don't think he ran out of fuel uh, on takeoff there. Uh, but Really, I think what it's going to boil down to, and again, I don't want to speculate because we're waiting on, on the NTSB final report, but it says here, airplane cargo was weighed at the accident site, revealing a load of about 520 pounds, uh, consisted primarily of moose meat and a set of moose, ants, moose antlers. About 150 pounds was found in the forward section of uh, the belly pod. I'm assuming that 150 is part of the 520 and not additional. And then the remaining portions were for, uh, firmly secured in the rear cabin. So the information that they provide for the weather was VMC overcast at 2,700 feet. Now, uh, this is showing, I think this weather is from uh, PASM, which I think is uh, St. Mary's. Uh, and so, again, this is about 80 miles away. So this wind speed and direction of 340 at 8 knots, I, I don't think it's really... Uh, that useful to what we know, especially when, you know, some of the hunters are talking about some of the gusty wind conditions uh, and how the wind is maybe changing from one end of the airstrip to the other based on the, the change in elevation and the terrain out there. So that's something else uh, that I know the NTSB will take a look at. All right. And if you're not familiar, here are the spe specifications uh, on the PA uh, 18115. Um, Let's see here. Any other questions we have on this so far? All right. Uh, so when we look at this initial report talking about the, the weight here of the meat, so you've got about 520 pounds 
it's saying. So right now for an empty weight uh, of a PA uh, 18 one, 150 Super Cub, you know, 930 pounds is your empty weight with a max takeoff weight of 1750. So if we take 930, you figure 200 pounds, you know, for the pilot puts you up at 1130 and then another 520 pounds on that, you're getting around six, what is that? 1650 or so. Uh, so you're, you're getting pretty close to the max takeoff weight uh, for the aircraft, especially when you add in fuel, depending on how much fuel they have on board. So I do think that is something that probably the NTSB is going to focus on to see if, if the aircraft is overweight. Cause from what it sounds like, you know, as the hunters are describing it. And, and again, these guys are probably not pilots, but they've, they've probably done this before. And, you know, they were able to see him take off one time. And so they, they know what that looked like. And then when he came back a second time, you know, watching him on that second takeoff, noticing that the ground roll took longer, the aircraft seemed to be more labored uh, than before. You know, that's something that's, that's definitely a consideration. Also, the other consideration is the, uh, the shifting center of gravity. So you have the, the moose meat that's in the back that's secured, you know, in the seats, but in the belly pod, you know, I don't know how much shifting the, there is or there could be with that and whether that has an impact or how much impact that would have on the center of gravity uh, for the aircraft because I don't fly a Super Cub. So if you guys, uh, if, if you're watching right now and you fly a Super Cub and, and you have an input on this, I'd love to hear from you guys and, and know what your thoughts are on that. So we're here in uh, 820 pounds useful load. So, you know, he, sh he, he might be close to that. Um, yeah, he, he might weigh more than 200 pounds, uh, and, and definitely some other people out there thinking about possibly being overweight, um, or, or a CG issue there. Now, this is something that I learned that I wasn't aware of because I don't fly in Alaska. <laughs> so this is new to me, but the, uh, FAA national policy, uh, has some guidance on fixed wing external loads. So this is I, I, as far as I know, the only state where you can have an external load on your aircraft uh, and it's authorized by the FAA. But there's a, a couple of things that are really important to take a look at in this. And it actually talks about game antlers uh, that I think is obviously relevant to what we're seeing out there. Because, you know, again, going back to that image, that, that's a pretty sizable set of antlers on the right hand side of the aircraft that are most likely going to cause some disruption to airflow um, and affect the aerodynamic capabilities of an aircraft, especially if you are close to a, a max takeoff weight, you know? So a couple of things that it says in here. Um, so it's the carriage of external loads temporarily attached to small fixed wing aircraft. The operation is approved only for small propeller driven airplanes with a max gross weight of 12,500 pounds or less within the state of Alaska only. And it talks about the remoteness of transportation, you know, so obviously air transportation is the only method to get supplies many times of the year. The pilot must have sufficient knowledge of external load attaching methods, the airplane's operating limitations for the external load and how the external load may affect the flight characteristics of the airplane. So that's definitely something that's, that's important to know. And I don't know what kind of experience uh, this individual had had. And again, I don't want to speculate or assume that this is the first time he did it. It could have been the hundredth, hundredth time that he's done something like this. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, the operator must take care when selecting and mounting an external load and exercise prudence to avoid operation outside the weight and balance envelope and avoid aerodynamic effects that make the operations unsafe. The majority of external loads are more likely to affect the lateral CG, but air, airplane manufacturers normally do not provide lateral CG charts or limits, so it's essential to determine what effect those loads will have on the lateral CG of an airplane. So obviously you got all that weight on the right-hand side, and, and I think the set of moose antlers that big, I, my guess is probably, you know, what, 50 to 70 pounds, something like that uh, for, for something that size. Um, so depending on how far out it is attached on that strut, it's kind of looks like about halfway up. 
um, that could have an impact uh, on the performance of the aircraft there uh, for the lateral CG to the right-hand side. I did see something else that talked about how uh, some of the pilots that do this and have flown these uh, antlers like this before, some of them prefer to attach it to the left-hand side so they can keep an eye on it, but others prefer to, to attach it uh, to the right-hand side. So I guess it's just a matter of preference and experience. Um, the section in here when talking about antlers, uh, there's uh, obviously numerous fasten fastening points because of their shape, um, but has been reported on some airplanes that antlers secured to the wing struts can cause a significant airflow disturbance to the tail surfaces. Antlers can also cause a significant amount of drag, which reduces airspeed, which should be considered in flight planning. So, not sure what, what your guys' thoughts are on that. Um, that. That's definitely something that, you know, in a in a challenging situation where you're possibly near the, the max gross takeoff weight uh, in a field where it looked like, if we go back to that picture uh, of the ridge line, you know, possibly he doesn't have, I don't know how much slope this goes over here. Um, or if this is more uphill and it's just taken at a weird camera angle, because it does say he departed slightly uphill, even though this image looks, uh, uh, the image looks downhill, uh, in the image there. So I, I'm not sure if he had more room for his takeoff run, if he wanted to, uh, to keep it on the ground longer. I don't know about using flaps on takeoff on a super cub, whether you want to do that at, at near max gross weight or not. Uh, cause I know you don't need to use flaps uh, on takeoff, uh, but it, it's something that, that could have been considered in this situation. Uh, the, there definitely is a large flat area that could have definitely affected the airflow, possibly causing directional problems than adding a shifting tailwind. And could have an airfoil effect and could have fouled the air over the elevator. So I agree with that as well. So, um, yeah, but again, I don't have any experience flying in Alaska, so it's 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 something that I, I'm I'm really curious to see what the NTSB final report says, uh, and we can kind of hopefully I don't know if they're going to share the video or not, so we can see what that that might have looked out like in that situation, and see how much um, uh, possibly that that had an impact uh, on the, on the aircraft there, but you know it's I think it's you know sometimes we get in these situations as pilots and it's, it's very easy. And I'm not saying that this happened with either of these pilots. So let me just be clear about that. But I do think it's easy as, as pilots. Sometimes you, you can get complacent, um, especially if you've flown in and out of the same field a number of times, or if you've done the same type of right operation over and over again, a, a certain number of times, you just, you know, after a certain number of hours, you just assume this is just going to be another routine takeoff. You know, nothing, nothing's going to happen. Right. And so one of the things that we do, at least as airline pilots, I hope everybody does as a pilot is, is you brief some sort of threat for every flight that you're going to do. And sometimes that that biggest threat is complacency, because, if, again, if you're used to doing that same thing over and over again, OK, like, hey, we've done this a thousand times before. That doesn't mean that this next time is the time that something is really going to go wrong and we need to be prepared for it. So let's talk about a couple of things that we may want to think about in, in that situation. So, um, let's see here. How to carry antler spe specified in official regulations? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. I, I was surprised. I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know that was a uh, that was a thing. But I, I guess I should have figured because it is Alaska. You know, uh, I don't know if it was a case of uh, of get there itis. It, it could have been. You know. Um, I don't know what influence, you know, the, uh, the hunters had and, you know, Hey, can we fit a, f a few more pounds of meat on board? Uh, but ultimately as a pilot, it's your responsibility to, you know, do that weight and balance and, and make sure your aircraft meets the performance requirements, you know, to perform the takeoff, uh, there. Would you consider a broadcast where you answer questions for non-pilots? Sure. I, yeah. I, I, you can ask your question right now because the, the great thing is, if I can't answer it, you've got, you know, 355 other people in the chat right now uh, that, that would love to answer that question. So, uh, Rob, thank you so much for the uh, for the super chat. Uh, and I appreciate it. I, I do feel like 
this is something I've, I've wanted to do for a long time, you know, getting out of the military. And when I started flying for the airlines, I, I was a little bit uh, hesitant to do it because of, uh, of the employer that I work for. And I didn't want to draw any attention to myself uh, uh, first getting started. Uh, but I, I'm glad I finally pulled the trigger on it and, and got this up and going. And, and again, it's been, I've just been so amazed by, <laughs> by this experience and the, the contributions that you guys share with me. And one of the things that I, I do want to share with you, I, I have, so if, if you guys haven't seen on my channel, I, I do a number of YouTube shorts in addition to my, my long form regular videos. And my shorts, initially when I started making YouTube shorts, the goal of those was I wanted to try to attract a, a new audience to aviation. You know, people that, you know, aren't pilots, people that have never flown before, but, but are thinking about becoming a pilot or getting their license because I think that that's the struggle in the aviation community is, is sometimes the, the, the cost to get into it is, is so high. That's, that's an initial turnoff. And just, you know, with, with the reducing number of air shows that we have and everything else, there's just not as many people interested in aviation anymore. And it's unfortunate. So that's why I started doing YouTube shorts in addition to my regular videos, because I know that, you know, a, a 25, 30 year old, you know, or somebody coming out of college may not be interested in an in-depth aviation mishap analysis, but they might be interested in, in a 30 to 60 second long video where they see a mishap happening. And I share a little bit of information about what happened. So that's the reason uh, why I started doing shorts. And it's, it's been interesting to see the demographics uh, of those that are engaging and, and how you know, have this opportunity to not only connect with people who have been flying and have, you know, many of you probably have a lot more hours than I do and a lot more experience, especially in the general aviation community, since I spent, you know, my 20 years in the military. Uh, but now I'm getting people engaging with the channel and sending me emails that have never flown before or that are, you know, trying to get the encouragement to go, you know, get their private pilot's license, you know, so it's, it's pretty exciting. And, and I'm really glad to, to be able to do that. So. Um, what do you think is a solution for the almost senseless accidents this year? I, I don't know if, if I'd have to look at the data to see if we've had a significant increase, uh, relative to the, to the year prior or not. I haven't actually looked at the numbers. Uh, my general sense is that the, uh, mishap trend is going down. The number of mishaps is going down. Uh, I know it's definitely gone down, you know, since a few decades ago. Um, I do think nowadays, especially over the last 10 to 15 years with the prevalence of social media and everybody out there with an iPhone, you know, or an Android, you know, film and stuff, we're just seeing it a lot more in the news, especially, you know, when, when we're talking about, you know, major airline mishaps or, or near, near misses, things like that, you know, runway incursions, that stuff tends to make the headlines, especially if you guys remember back at the beginning of this year, we had, you know, there was probably a string of about five or six of a uh, major airline you know, runway incursions, uh, you know, out at Austin, you had a, uh, a FedEx and Southwest, uh, uh, near, 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 near collision, if you will, um, landing, uh, in South landing in Austin, you had one in JFK. Um, I think we had one out in Hawaii. Uh, so there, there, there's been quite a few, but all of those are stuff that I think we're just seeing it in the news more. And so it's not necessarily that it's happening uh, more often. It's just the news, the news knows what sells and they're trying to, to get that stuff out there. So uh, just, just Ed, we're just seeing the moose antlers hanging out the window would scare the heck out of me. Yeah, it's, it's definitely um, uh, interesting. Um, Dewey, you shouldn't be scared to fly. So uh, I, I would, I, I do get this from a lot of people too, people that are scared to fly, but you know, ha have courage. <laughs> the people that are out there, the majority of pilots that are, that are flying today, uh, it's, you know, in the general aviation community are responsible and safe pilots that, that do the right thing, uh, and, and prep for their flights, you know, and when it comes to commercial travel, I think commercial travel hasn't been safer, uh, than what it is today. So, um, and, if you guys have, I'll throw this out there too. If you guys have a suggestion for someone that you would like to see on this live stream as a guest host in the future, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'm going to have a, a really good friend of mine. He's a, uh, he's a general aviation pilot and a, a World War II aviation expert uh, who can tell you pretty much anything there is to know about World War II aviation. Uh, he's going to be on the show uh, next week. 
And then uh, Brian Murray, if you haven't uh, heard of him, I would check out his YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to have him on the show uh, as well the following week. And I've already reached out to a few other uh, folks as well, which I think is going to provide for some really interesting discussion and give you guys an option uh, or the opportunity to uh, engage uh, with different people. Um, looks like this question was answered, but uh, talking about the uh, air traffic control telling a pilot he's cleared for the option. What does that mean? Uh, and then the answer here, you have the option to do a touch and go, uh, stop and go or full stop land. So basically giving you the, the, the maximum flexibility. You see that a lot, you know, at these uh, smaller airports, uh, usually in class D airspace um, where, you know, you're trying to do multiple patterns and get some experience there. How about Juan Brown? Yep. Uh, I, I've reached out to him prior, uh, previously. Uh, I never heard back, but I, I do need to follow up with him. Uh, I know he's, he's got a great channel and he does a really good job covering uh, aviation mishaps uh, on, on a regular basis. So uh, we'll be looking looking forward to that. Hopefully I hear back from him in the future. So um, what other questions you guys got? My, my intent with these, I don't want to run them too long. And, you know, I wanted to shoot for, for Mondays uh, around this time because I think hopefully it works out for everybody. If, if not, we can look at changing it. Uh, but in general, I'm, I'm completely open to your feedback. And Speaking of feedback, that was the, the one point that I was trying to make earlier with, with YouTube Shorts is, you know, some of these videos I've made, I've, I've actually, if, if you don't know this, there's two videos that I've, I've taken down from my channel uh, only because I got the analysis wrong. Uh, and I'm okay with saying that because I make mistakes. And I think that's important as a pilot that you have to recognize when you make mistakes. And so when it comes to my long form content, the videos that I upload every Sunday, you know, that tend to be about eight to 15 minutes long. I, I put a significant amount of time and research into those to make sure I'm presenting the content uh, in a way that, that you guys can benefit the most from it. When it comes to my YouTube shorts, I try to do the same thing, but it's often, you know, those are 30 to 60 second long videos. And sometimes it's, it's really hard to explain an entire aviation mishap in a 30 to 60 second long video. And so sometimes I say things that may not be hundred percent accurate, but when I get that feedback from you guys in the comments, especially, you know, for an airplane that I haven't flown before, if you're offering those comments, I, I, I try to read every single comment that I get on my channel and I try to respond to as many of them as I can, given my time constraints. Um, but when the feedback is overwhelmingly leaning in one direction, you know, that of a mistake that I made, I'd rather you know, take that video off of YouTube, knowing that I'm going to lose views because that that's part of the thing that, that will get more views is if it gets more comments and engagement. But I, I don't want the views if, if what I'm saying is inaccurate and a misrepresentation, you know, for the aviation community. So, you know, please keep, keep those comments coming. And if you guys haven't already, if, if you want to support, you know, the aviation community and you want to support all the work that I'm doing, if you haven't already, please consider becoming a channel member. Uh, I offer that out there. I, I, th I think I've got it set at, you know, it's like $1.99 a month, basically. And what that does is it helps me to support my efforts for all the time and effort I, I go into researching and producing uh, all these videos as well. So uh, I would appreciate that. Um, I, I, I don't know about that, Rob. <laughs> uh, and I know, I know you're being a uh, cavalier with that. Um, Yes, this is this is probably one of the the top comments that I get on almost all of my YouTube shorts. Is uh, people think uh, I'm related to Stevo uh, from from the show Jackass? So uh, I'm not related to Stevo. Maybe I can have him as a guest on my show uh, in in the future. <laughs> so uh, we'll see we'll see if we can reach out to him. Um, and then let's see here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, baby girl PC uh, there. Uh, yeah, there, there are, and you guys know, there's, there's some other great aviation channels out there. You know, you've got seven, four uh, gear, you know, he obviously uh, caters, I, I think to a little bit younger audience and covers just mostly the um, uh, airliner part 121 type stuff, mentor pilot, somebody else mentioned, 
you've got, you know, the Blanca Lirio channel, uh, Dan Greider, probable cause, you know, so there's, there's a lot of good folks out there. And I think that's the, that's the nice thing about the community is there's, there's people that, that want to give back and they, they want to share, you know, with, with others that are interested in aviation and, and break down these mishaps and things like that. So uh, again, um, all right. Well, those are the two mishaps that we wanted to cover that I wanted to cover and talk about today. You know, obviously again, just highlighting, you know, really sad. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't plan to talk about this one. Um, it, it just hit the news last night. You know, originally I was only going to talk, uh, about the, uh, the, the tragedy in Alaska, w- which is, uh, unfortunate. Um, but again, just, a a really sad reminder that, that this stuff like this happens, you know? So, um, I won't drag this out any longer. It's been 45 minutes and I want to keep these, you know, somewhere, uh, between that 30, 30 minutes to no longer than an hour. So that way you guys can get as much out of this as possible. And again, engaging with some different guests and covering, you know, some of the more, uh, recent news that's happened in the aviation community. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Look forward to uh, to seeing you guys in the comments in the future. And if you're catching this on a replay, go ahead and drop a comment below uh, if you have a question, if something that I didn't talk about. And I'd be glad to uh, get back to you. You know, like I said, I try to answer as many uh, uh, many of the comments and address many of the questions as possible. So thanks again, and I'll see you guys on the uh, the next pilot debrief. <laughs>